Okay, we are back with part two of looking at chapter one on Ed Psych and effective teaching. So we left off with number seven when it comes to effective teaching traits. And number seven is looking at the fact that you need to be not only flexible, flexible to change things, flexible to recognize when things aren't working out, but also willing to admit when you make mistakes. And believe me, as a teacher, you're going to be making a lot of mistakes. You won't mean to, but it's just going to happen. So when that does occur, whether it is a poorly written test question, whether it is forgetting to post something that you're supposed to post, you need to be able to admit when you've made a mistake. Um, I thought this was a funny post. So here's a teacher saying, when you're a teacher and your dog eats everybody's homework. Okay, that may not happen to you, but mistakes are going to happen. You need to not only be flexible and willing to admit them, but also you need to be able to make adjustments when students point out these errors. Uh, you don't want to make them feel bad. You need to be open to their input. They need to feel welcome enough to know that they can point out something to you. Here's a video I found on crappy lessons. I know it's an interesting title, but as a teacher, we're all going to have them. So let's take a moment and think about what happens when we teach a lesson and it just doesn't work out. So in my first week in the classroom, I planned out this really cool get to know you kind of mini project. And it would be a chance where students could explore all the key ideas from the different elements of social studies. And they were going to display this in a collage. Now I had gathered together all kinds of magazines. I had reached out to my network and my friends. And every single part of this was well planned to a T. I mean, this was the foolproof first week. It was going to be epic. But it wasn't. It tanked. And I don't mean like it tanked a little bit. It tanked badly. Students began to argue over who was going to get the magazines. They went from just talking to talking louder to basically shouting across the room until it was an ear-splitting decibel level. And then there were the moments where they just poured paint and it was on the desks and it was on the ground. And I remember at one point with one of the class periods, I got frustrated and I raised my voice, which is just a nice way of saying I yelled. And then I had to apologize, of course, and I felt awful. And I left that particular day on my third day of teaching, feeling like the biggest failure in the world. Now that doesn't feel good and it isn't fun, but you know what? Crappy lessons. They're the kind of things that allow us to reflect and grow as teachers. They're what keep us humble. We need those moments. In fact, I would say that they are evidence that we're taking creative risks, that we're working on our craft. So the bottom line is, as you enter the classroom, you can plan your lessons out as good as possible. You can have all the strategies in the world. You can have this thing nailed, or so you think. But you are going to have crappy lessons, and that's okay. It's part of what it means to be a teacher. So welcome to the club. And I also love his point that crappy lessons are also showing you that you're pushing the limits, that you're being inventive. Okay, on to our topics. Number eight, you need to try to make sure that your students feel like they're part of a community. So what can you do to cultivate that? I thought I'd pose that question. Can you think of examples of things that teachers have done? Admittedly, it is harder under this new distance learning COVID paradigm, um, but still you have to constantly think about what can you do. One of the things that I have done is by using the GroupMe on our phones, hoping that that creates some sort of an online community. You want to make your students feel welcome, that they are part of the class, that their opinions are going to be heard. You want them to feel comfortable enough that they can be open to learn and open to discuss and share things. Uh, this is a short video on greeting students. Now, obviously, we can't do something like this now. I love that not only does she welcome them, but she gives them choice and how they would like to be welcomed. Not everybody wants a hug. Some people do. Uh, and there are also a lot of activities you can do to try to build that sense of community. Uh, another part of this is you want to make sure that your students feel accepted. You're going to have a lot of student differences, whether we are looking at language barriers, um, ethnicity, students with IEPs, um, students with simply different learning styles. 
gender differences. Uh, you want to make sure that all of your students feel accepted and welcome in your classroom. Um, I like this. A lot of schools now are starting to look at building house systems, like from Hogwarts for Harry Potter, not just for Harry Potter fans, but for all students to give them another way to connect. Number nine, what can you do to display a personal touch in your room? There are two ways this works. One is sharing a bit of yourself, and one is also getting to know your students. So here's a teacher who's sharing a bit of herself by using a Harry Potter approach to her classroom. And as I mentioned, another part of this is connecting with your students personally, getting to know them. What are they interested in? What are they doing? What do they like? How do they learn? I love this quote that taking time to get to know our students isn't fluff time. It is academic time. It is meaningful. Here's a teacher who uh, starts off the day writing positive, um, personalized messages on everybody's desk. You can also share that personal touch by sharing a little bit of yourself. Now, not too much, and don't go on and on on tangents about where you went on vacation last summer, but little personal touches to let them get to know you and to connect with you. That's the goal. How can they connect with you? Uh, here's one way of doing this. Now, this takes a lot of time. This is a dedicated teacher to do dialogue journals with your students. So they are writing, you're writing back, and you're connecting with them in that way. Uh, and then take that personal interest. Go to their sporting events. Perhaps sit down with them in the cafeteria. Um, you know, what can you do to reach out and get to know them? So I love this. So here's a teacher. Her students are going on a field trip. She could spend the whole day like lesson planning or heck playing solitaire in her classroom. But what does she do? She wrote letters to each of her students to give to them at the end of the year. How awesome. All right, number 10, you need to be respectful and show compassion. What do I mean by that? Well, here's the opposite of it. So you don't want to be the, the teacher who's just known for being um, a hard nose about grading or the teacher that is being disrespectful, like Severus Snape down below. You wanna let them know that you're concerned about their feelings, that you care about their problems, that you're there to help them. Um, I love this quote below, unless our students know that we care, they're not gonna learn from us. Uh, here's another example, now this one's kinda of long, you can pause and read the whole thing if you like, but this is a, a teacher who's saying that she saw that one of her students was just having a hard time, having a bad day, and she gave the student a one minute hug and that she found that in doing so, that this really helped the student kind of calm down and center themselves and how it was a meaningful moment, all in 70 seconds. And here's uh, one shared by uh, Marcy Kiefer Kennedy, one of our faculty members here at OU, the idea that teachers make a difference and that's more important than what we are paid. Uh, and then also, in part of this idea of being respectful, you also need to make sure you are respecting your students' privacy, that you're not talking about your students, you're not uh, listing names of students outside of the classroom, that you are respecting their privacy when it comes to personal stories at school and how they're learning and so on. Number 11, you need to be fair with your students, that you're fair in how you're grading them and how you handle your discipline problems, um, I put that little uh, meme down below because this can sometimes relate to how you're grading your papers. Part of fairness is also making sure that you're providing equity. I think that this is a great visual, so I'm going to get my laser pointer out here. This first picture shows equality. Equality means each kid got the same block to stand on. They got equal resources. But do they each have a good view over the fence? Does that work? This is the idea of equity. Equity is giving each student what they need, and they each need something different to have that um, equitable opportunity to see over the fence or to learn in your class. Uh, another part of being fair is making sure that your requirements and your instructions are clear. It is not fair to grade your students or to assess them, especially if you're assessing them harshly on something that you didn't give good instructions for. And finally, understanding that not everybody learns in the same way. This is a pretty famous cartoon down below. So we've got a variety of animals lined up. 
and the teacher is saying, for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Well, that is certainly not fair. Not all of those animals are going to be able to do that, and we need to think about that when it comes to how we're assessing our students. And last but not least, number 12 is being passionate. Caring about your classroom. Caring about how you teach and about your subject matter. Um, enthusiasm is the match that lights the candle of achievement. I like that. Um, here's a wonderful video from, um, this is a first year teacher, and he made this to welcome his fourth grade class. about you but I love that guy um, I wish my kid could have his class and you can see he fits that last point of motivating students you can't tell me that every student who watched that video wasn't excited to go to his class that's what I mean by being passionate all right we're gonna pause here I know this is a shorter video but this will be the end of the segment when it comes to effective teaching thank you for your attention and I'll sign off until next time